Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to another uh, Dhamma talk here at Empty Cloud Monastery. Uh, so, as usual, we'll begin with a period of um, sitting meditation. Uh, then, after the sitting meditation, we'll uh, have a Dhamma talk uh, on the subject of jhana. Uh, and then I'll take any questions that you have at the end. So for now, please go ahead and get in a comfortable sitting posture uh, so we can do some meditation practice together. So taking a, a minute or two at the beginning of your meditation to make sure you're settled, um, nice balanced posture, making sure that your Sitting bones are arranged in such a way that your legs won't fall asleep. And that the base of your pelvis is tilted slightly forward so that your spine is naturally upright. And so it doesn't take effort to hold the spine upright. Letting your chin tilt very slightly down so that your throat is completely open and you can breathe naturally without any effort. So you can experiment with tilting your head back a little bit and then forward. And you'll notice that when your neck is too far forward, then your throat collapses and it's a little harder to breathe. When it's too far back, then your throat gets bent and it's a little bit hard to breathe. So you'll find that there's a place in between, which usually is with the chin tilted slightly down, uh, where you can breathe completely easily. Similarly, bringing your shoulders up and swinging them back so that your chest opens and expands. This also makes it easier to breathe in a very natural way. As you settle into your seat, bringing your hands to rest together in your lap in Samadhi Mudra. So with your hands uh, resting together and your thumb tips lightly touching, you just let this rest in your lap uh, close to your abdomen. And you can remind yourself I am about to engage in the same practices that every awakened being has practiced. Uh, doing the same meditations that have been done by all of the arhats, all of the bodhisattvas, all of the buddhas. They've all done these same practices. So I am following the same well-traveled path that every awakened being has followed, this well-traveled path that leads in one direction only, and that is towards awakening. So taking a moment to experience the happiness of knowing that we are on the path to awakening, the safe, direct path that leads inevitably to awakening. And this safe, direct path begins with mindfulness of the body. And this safe, direct path includes the development of samadhi, 
concentration. So knowing that mindfulness of the body and concentration all the way up to jhana level concentration, knowing that these are important parts of the path, we commit ourselves to practicing samadhi through using mindfulness of the body. Just as has been done by countless awakened beings before us on their own journey to enlightenment. So bringing attention to the body, feeling this heavy, warm, moist mass of flesh. Gently inflating and deflating with each breath. So being completely comfortable with this body right here, right now. Knowing that the Buddha had a body just like this one. All the Arhants had bodies just like this one. Ours is no different. It's the same heavy, warm, wet, airy mass. just a natural part of the universe. And an excellent focus for attention. So with complete acceptance of this body as a natural part of reality, and an easy focal point. We bring attention within the body. Beginning by feeling the whole body all at once. If you're sitting cross-legged, it's a roughly pyramidal mass of flesh, roughly pyramid-shaped zone of sensations. So not trying to separate the different physical sensations within this area, but just feeling it all at once, feeling the whole body as a single sensation, a single object, a single domain of awareness. And within this pyramid-shaped zone of sensation, somewhere near the center, you'll find your hands. With the thumb tips lightly touching, right near the center point. So let your mind rest at that center point. If you want a larger area, you can feel your whole hands. If you want a more refined point, you can focus just on the tips of your thumbs as they lightly touch.
So still feeling the whole body with the mind resting, still, unmoving, completely alert, centered at the hands. completely interested in the body, interested in the experience of the body moment by moment. And enjoying the body, enjoying this intense, alert awareness of the body. You might let a slight smile come to your lips. As you enjoy awareness of the body. Perceiving the body sensations as pleasant. And soothing warmth of the body. And the reassuring heaviness of the body. the pleasant electric tingling of awareness saturating the whole body. So relishing this experience of the body. And the more intently you focus on your body, the stronger that pleasant sensation becomes. The more intense, the euphoric, rapturous pleasure becomes. So keep building up that euphoric, pleasant sensation all through the body.
as if awareness was a warm, radiant light, bringing pleasure and joy to every single corner of the whole body, all at once. A peaceful, stable, bright, pleasant warmth. And the more still the body is, the more still the mind is the more alert the mind is, the stronger this bright, warm pleasure becomes. All the happiness and pleasure you've ever wanted is accessible right here, right now, in this body. All it takes is attention and stillness, enjoying this body with attention and stillness. Keep building up that bright, soothing, stable euphoria. Through stillness and attention to the body.
keep the mind still, centered at your hands. Don't let it wander.
So when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes and adjust your posture. You can gently massage your legs or your shoulders or your knees or anywhere else that needs a little soothing attention. Just take a moment to appreciate the joyful stillness of the mind. So I see uh, many people have checked in. So welcome to everyone who's joining in tonight. Uh, Gita, Joy, Jayanta, Anita, Mary, Denise, Rick, Roy, Jenny, Manuel, Kumu, Angela, Umaro, Putrika, Tejo, Buddhi, Marielle, and Chapul. So welcome all of you. So at this time, I'll pay homage to the Buddhas and then give a, a talk about uh, jhanas. Uh, and then I'll take any questions you have at the end. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Bundhang dhammang sanghang namasami. So, uh, tonight we'll be talking about jhana, uh, which um, over the past couple thousand years, this has often been a somewhat controversial topic to discuss. Uh, and the main reason for that is because there's uh, a lot of different opinions uh, about jhana. Uh, a lot of opinions about what defines jhana, uh, how to enter jhana, um, how to tell whether or not a meditative experience was jhana, uh, or what stage of jhana it was. Um, there's also been some controversy, some discussion about whether or not jhana is, is actually necessary to attain awakening. Uh, and uh, there's also been many, uh, many teachers who speak about experiences of jhana. Um, and the descriptions given by different teachers don't always match with each other. So uh, even to this day, so these days there are several prominent, well-known contemporary monastics who teach jhana. Um, and each one of those teachers has their own slightly different approach slightly different descriptions of how to uh, enter jhana, what the experience is like, uh, how to relate uh, jhana practice to the development of insight, the development of, of wisdom, uh, and different ways of describing uh, the aspects, the characteristics of, of jhana, of each stage of jhana. So the way I'll be talking about it tonight is the way that makes the most sense to me and which um, seems to line up the best with my own meditation experiences, uh, my own 
experiences with trying to, to practice samadhi, trying to cultivate uh, strong samadhi. Uh, and also which lines up with uh, the instruction I've received from my own, my own teachers, um, particularly my, my preceptor and primary teacher, uh, Ajahn Pasano. Um, so first off, just to give a, a very basic uh, definition. So when we're talking about jhana, uh, what we're talking about is very strong samadhi. Uh, and those who are not used to Pali are probably disappointed that I just defined one Pali word by using another Pali word. Uh, but there are some Pali words which there's really no satisfactory translation, and you just need to learn what these words mean. Uh, so jhana is a technical term, and there's really no translation for jhana. Uh, so that is one word which, which I don't think is proper to even try to, to translate. Uh, it should just remain as the word jhana. The word samadhi, on the other hand, is commonly translated as concentration, uh, which is a reasonable enough translation. Uh, literally, what it means is, is collecting or holding together. Uh, so in samadhi practice, what we're trying to do is, is to collect together all of our disparate, wandering mental processes uh, and hold it all together. Uh, into a single unified uh, mind, a single unified uh, action of mind, a single unified field of mind. Uh, and usually this is done through mm, focusing on some particular object or theme. Um, there is also objectless samadhi, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight because that is a much uh, different topic. Uh, it's one which I do talk about frequently, but it's not, uh, not particularly relevant to what we're talking about tonight. So normally one chooses a, an object of attention, uh, and one focuses one's attention on that object uh, until the mind becomes completely unified and stabilized around that object. So this is the development of samadhi. And one of the um, simplest and most straightforward definitions of jhana, uh, which I got, again, from my own primary teacher, uh, is that jhana is what happens when the mind is free from the five hindrances and does not move from its object. So a very simple definition. Uh, so uh, two characteristics, free from the hindrances, and not moving from its object. So very simple, but very direct and very useful description of jhana. Uh, so, uh, and also it relates to one of the, the suttas where the Buddha talks about jhana, where he says that the enemy of first jhana is the five hindrances. Um, so this, this is a similar statement. So if you want to attain the first jhana, then you need to overcome the five hindrances. It's our basic requirement. So uh, the five hindrances are, first off, kama chanda, which means um, interest in sensuality. So interest in any kind of sensual pleasure. Uh, so whether through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or even through thought. So as long as you're interested in, in pleasant sights and pleasant sounds and pleasant smells and pleasant touches and pleasant thoughts, then you will not be interested in samadhi. So if you're sitting there thinking about that fabulous zucchini pasta uh, or those lovely little cookies, well, you're not going to get even remotely close to jhana. Uh, in fact, you're not going to have much samadhi at all. Uh, you'll just be sitting there indulging in, in your interest in sensual experiences. So uh, this is the, the first critical one, is setting aside all interest in sensuality. Um, and in fact, in the Buddhist standard description of, of the first jhana, this is the very first thing he says. Uh, the very first thing the Buddha says is viviceva kamehi. So vivicha means uh, separated from, uh, and kamehi means uh, from sensuality. So this very basic requirement for uh, jhana practice is to uh, set aside sensuality, uh, to put aside our interest in sensual experiences. 
Um, the second of the five hindrances is aversion, uh, vyapada in Pali. Uh, so this resistance to anything, really. Um, so it can be aversion towards other people. It can be aversion towards particular sensations. Uh, maybe you really hate the sound of the dehumidifier in the back of the room. Or maybe you really hate the person you're sitting next to. I hope not, but maybe you do. Uh, or maybe you really hate mm, the feeling of your clothing against your skin. Uh, or maybe you really hate yourself. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what you're hating. If you hate anything at all, then the mind will be agitated and disturbed and it will not be able to enter strong samadhi. Um, the third hindrance is, in Pali, it's called tina midda, uh, which means dullness, uh, dullness of mind, uh, drowsiness of mind, hazy mind. Uh, which is, uh, it can be caused just by sleep deprivation. So it's, it's important to make sure that you're well rested. If you want to have good meditation, make sure you're well rested. Don't be sleep deprived. It doesn't help. Make sure you're getting the right amount of sleep. Not too much, not too little. Um, and also make a really sincere effort to be very interested in your meditation object and to uh, really put effort and energy into your meditation practice. Uh, this is the, the way to keep the mind from being overcome by, by dullness and drowsiness. Um, and the fourth hindrance is uddacha kukucha, uh, which means agitation, restlessness. Uh, can also mean remorse or regret, uh, but the main meaning here is, is agitation and restlessness. Uh, so, and the Buddha gives a very interesting remedy for this one. Uh, so in one sutta, the Buddha says that the remedy for uh, agitation and restlessness is to pay attention to the element of tranquility. In other words, the Buddha is saying that in every single moment, there is some amount of tranquility present. So tranquility is always here. We just, sometimes we forget and we stop paying attention to it. So when the mind is very restless, we'll pay attention to the element of tranquility. Look for tranquility in your experience and pay attention to it. And as you do that, tranquility will become stronger and restlessness will start fading. So when I first read that description, I actually found it a bit disappointing. I was like, how do you deal with restlessness? And the Buddha says, pay attention to the element of tranquility. And I was just like, how does that make any sense? When you're agitated, there is no element of tranquility. But then I actually tried it. The next time I was having restlessness during meditation, I started paying attention to the element of tranquility. And lo and behold, the mind started to become more peaceful. The mind started to become more tranquil and serene. So I found that fascinating, uh, that tranquility is present even when we think we're agitated. And if we just turn attention towards tranquility, then the mind starts to, to get in line with that. Um, and the fifth hindrance is in um, Pali, it's vichikitcha, which means skepticism uh, or doubt. Uh, so in the context of meditation practice, uh, we are setting aside all of our doubts and just committing ourselves fully to the meditation exercise. So for the time being, we're not worried at all about whether or not we're doing the right thing. We just do it and we see what happens. Of course, this helps quite a bit if you already have strong faith in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Uh, if you already have strong faith in enlightenment, strong faith in awakened beings, uh, strong faith in the path, uh, which is why at the very beginning of the meditation, I said to uh, remind yourself, uh, remind yourself that you're doing the same practices that every other being has done in order to attain awakening, that you're following a well-traveled road. Uh, you're not making this up yourself. You're just doing what everybody else before you has done. Uh, you're not inventing your own path. You're just following the same 
well-traveled highway that everybody else has followed. So this deep faith that we're doing the right thing and we're on the right path and we're following the path that leads inevitably towards awakening. Uh, this helps to give us the, the stability of mind that's necessary for strong samadhi. So I don't want to go into too much detail on the five hindrances or else I'll be here for two hours just talking about the five hindrances. So it's a great topic to, to go into in great depth. Um, but for now, suffice to say, set aside the five hindrances uh, and keep your mind steady on your meditation object. And actually, if you just do that, then you'll enter jhana. And jhana is actually really not complicated. Um, it's very simple. Pick something to focus your mind on and keep it there. That's really it. Uh, keep your mind awake and still. Focused on one object. And you'll enter jhana sooner or later. That's really all there is to it. Uh, but that said, there's a few, there's a few um, things which can help quite a bit. So I'll talk a bit about the characteristics of especially first and second jhana because these are the most important ones to know about. Um, realistically, third and fourth jhana, um, if you haven't entered even first jhana, then debating about the characteristics of fourth jhana is just, it's just a pointless game. It's not going to do you much good. It's much more important to be familiar with the characteristics of first jhana and second jhana because that's what you're aiming at. Once you get some familiarity with the early stages of jhana, then you can start to turn your attention towards third and fourth jhana. But the really important ones are to, are to know about the entry level stages. These are difficult enough as it is. Uh, so uh, I'd like to focus on, on the first and second jhana. Um, so the first and second jhana are quite similar, uh, but they have a couple important differences. Um, so first off, the first jhana, the Buddha um, describes it uh, in Pali. He says, Viviceva kamehi, uh, which means separated from sensuality, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Vivicha akusalehi damehi, means separated from uh, all unwholesome states, all unwholesome uh, mind states or phenomena. So this can be taken to refer to uh, all of the other hindrances. Um, then uh, he continues, savitakang savicharang, so that means with uh, thought and mental movement. Vivekajang piti sukang, uh, so that means with the euphoria uh, and pleasure produced by seclusion, in this case, uh, or separation from uh, sensuality and from the, the rest of the five hindrances. Patamang jhanang upasam paja viharati. So one uh, enters the first jhana. So then the characteristics of the first jhana, first off, the mind is completely uninterested in sensuality. Uh, and it's also not caught up in any other unwholesome mind state, uh, such as aversion or dullness or restlessness or skepticism. So it starts off, once again, setting aside the five hindrances. Uh, and uh, another critical element of first jhana um, is that first jhana is characterized by powerful euphoria, uh, which in Pali is called piti. Uh, so this, this intense, um, rapturous euphoria, which is felt all through the body. Uh, and the, one of the reasons why this is so important, you know, first off, it's unmistakable. This is one of the unmistakable characteristics of first jhana. Um, every now and then somebody will, will describe a meditation experience to me and they'll say something like, my mind was very peaceful and very alert and very still, um, but I wasn't experiencing any, any particular pleasant sensation. Uh, was that jhana? And the answer is no, that was not jhana. Oh. Uh, the defining characteristic of first and second jhana is euphoria. If you're not experiencing the most unbelievably intense, electric, overwhelming euphoria you've ever had in your life, then you're not experiencing first or second jhana. And before you ask, no, it's not possible to skip directly to third jhana. Um, so these, these occur sequentially. So you go from an ordinary state of mind to first jhana, then to second, then to third, then to fourth. 
you cannot skip directly to third jhana. So if you are not experiencing intense full body euphoria, then you are not in first or second jhana. You might have strong samadhi that is approaching jhana, that's possible, um, but without that strong euphoria, you know that you're not there yet. So this is one of the critical hallmarks of both first and second jhana is this intense euphoria. Another reason why this is a very important characteristic is that it can be used as a springboard to enter jhana. So during the meditation instructions, uh, you might recall that I placed a lot of emphasis and importance on enjoying the body, building up this experience of, of pleasure, uh, of uh, using mindfulness of the body as a way of deeply enjoying the body perceiving the body as something very pleasant. In this way, you can start to generate PT. You can start to generate this rapture, this euphoria. Uh, and by generating it, then you can start building it up and strengthening it. And by building up and strengthening that euphoria, that PT, then that will also build up your, your sati and your samadhi. So your mindfulness and your concentration because in order to strengthen the, the euphoria, the euphoric sensation in the body, then you need to have stronger sati, so stronger mindfulness uh, and better concentration. So these qualities come up together. So you can focus on the cultivation of physical euphoria as a way of developing sufficient mindfulness and concentration to enter jhana. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a shortcut uh, to jhana. Um, there aren't a lot of shortcuts. Um, in fact, jhana is notoriously lacking in shortcuts. But this is one, uh, which is to intentionally cultivate the quality of, of euphoria uh, and focus your mind on that. Um, and this will automatically cultivate the mindfulness and samadhi necessary to enter, enter into first jhana. Another defining characteristic of first jhana is that it's accompanied by uh, thought and mental movement. So there's still a certain amount of mental activity occurring in first jhana. So what we call vitaka and vichara, uh, mental activities. And there is a fair amount of debate about this. So the other characteristics of first jhana, pretty much everybody agrees more or less on what they mean. Uh, but when it comes to vitaka and vichara, there's a lot of opinions. Um, one of the simplest ways of understanding this is that because the mind is not yet fully stable, the mind is still twitching a bit. There's still a certain amount of background noise in the mind. Uh, even in first jhana, there's a certain amount of background noise in the mind. It's not enough to distract us from our meditation. So the mind, is, it doesn't move from its object, but it is... Uh, fluctuating a bit. So the mind is not yet completely stabilized. Um, and there still can be a certain amount of background thought occurring in the mind. It just doesn't distract us. Similarly to when you're, you're staring very intently at something, there might be some objects in your peripheral vision, but they don't distract you. In the same way, with first jhana, you can be completely focused on your meditation. And there might be some mental movement in the background, but it doesn't break your concentration. That's one way of relating to these terms. Um, another way of relating to these terms, Vitaka and Vichara, is that they represent the effort one is making to stay on one's meditation. So again, first jhana is not yet completely stabilized. Uh, the mind is still fluctuating and wavering a bit. So one is putting forward a certain amount of effort to keep one's mind uh, fixated in, on the meditation object. So this is another way that people will talk about vitaka and vichara is that this is the mental activity of fixating on your mental uh, on your uh, meditation object. And I find both of these these descriptions relatively useful. Uh, so the it's it's really more a matter of what what helps you. Uh, but keeping in mind that vitaka and vichara are themselves. Mm, still an element of distraction. 
there's still an element of, of disruption in, in the mind. Um, so it said, uh, again, in one of the suttas, the Buddha says that while in first jhana, if one turns one's attention towards vitaka and vichara, then one will fall out of jhana. And one will fall back to an ordinary state uh, of samadhi, uh, but not, not any longer in first jhana. So we want to be careful not to fixate on vitaka and vichara, that mental activity, that mental movement. Um, instead, we want to focus uh, on, again, you can focus on piti and sukha, so this euphoric happiness, this, this euphoric pleasure, uh, which, uh, again, you can use as an entry point to first jhana. You can focus on that because that's also present in second jhana, so the next stage of samadhi. Um, but if you focus on vitaka and vichara, you will not get stronger samadhi, and in fact, you might fall out of first jhana entirely. So the second jhana, uh, which I'll, I'll talk a bit about, and then I'll, I'll say some more general words about jhana practice, and then, then we'll take some questions. The second jhana, the Buddha says, vitaka vichara nang vupasama, so that means with the pacification of mental activity. Uh, so in second jhana, then uh, mental activity ceases. Uh, the mind is no longer wavering. There's no more background noise. Um, there's no longer effort needed to stay on the meditation object. The mind stays on its meditation object very easily and naturally. Uh, then he says, ajatang sampasadhanang. So this means uh, internal uh, serenity, internal stability, uh, internal clarity. Uh, so with second jhana, the mind finally becomes completely stable and clear. So in first jhana, the mind is, is still a little bit wobbly and hazy. Uh, nothing like our ordinary state of mind. Our ordinary state of mind is, is like mud by comparison. Um, first jhana, it's more like water that has just a little bit of dust in it. Uh, just slightly, slightly murky still. Um, but in second jhana, that's, that's settled down. So the mind is, is finally completely stable and clear. So ajatang sampasadana. And uh, the third characteristic he mentions is chetaso ekodi bhava. So this means unification of mind. This also is interesting because uh, first jhana, the mind is not 100% unified because there's still that certain amount of mental activity happening. So the mind does not stray from its object. So the mind doesn't get distracted from the meditation. If you got distracted, you would fall out of first jhana entirely. So in first jhana, the mind doesn't get distracted, but it's not yet completely unified. It's not yet completely um, settled and collected. With second jhana though, we have this, this quality of chetaso e kodi bhava, so unification of mind. Um, and then the Buddha says, avitakang avicharang, so without any mental activities, samadhi jang piti sukha. So this is the euphoric pleasure born from samadhi, this complete uh, unification, collection, and stability of mind, uh, then produces an even more intense and uh, peaceful euphoria. Uh, and he says, Dutyang Janang Upasampajavaharati. So one enters the second jhana. So again, noticing that the shared characteristic between first and second jhana is this euphoria. Uh, so this is one reason why euphoria is a very safe and direct way of entering jhana. Uh, is that it, uh, it will bring you into first jhana, which is your entry, entry zone. Uh, but it can also bring you all the way into second jhana where the mind is finally stabilized. The mind is finally dropped uh, all of its thought and mental movement uh, and is finally completely um, unified and stabilized uh, on the meditation object. So that's a bit about first and second jhana. Um, so I don't want to go into detail on the third and fourth jhana because then we'll be here quite a bit longer than we have time for. Um, but briefly speaking, in third jhana, uh, one relinquishes euphoria. Uh, so moving to a more peaceful state of mind, a more peaceful happiness of mind. Um, and in fourth jhana, one's, one's mind shifts into equanimity. Uh, so with fourth jhana, one loses interest in pleasure entirely. 
and the mind is interested only in complete uh, peaceful stillness. Um, but again, we're not getting into that today. I'd like to focus on first and second jhana because for most people, this is what's relevant. And realistically, if you're already deeply familiar with second jhana, then you're going to figure out third jhana on your own pretty quickly, sooner or later. Uh, so this talk is not for those of you who are already masters of second jhana. It's not going to be of much use for you. Uh, it's for everybody else. So those who are still working on, on getting into first jhana or maybe have had some experience with, with first jhana or second jhana, but are not, not quite clear on how it happened or how to, how to get back to that state um, or what, what supports it. So it is important to emphasize, um, although so far I've been talking about techniques and methods for, of meditation which lead towards jhana, it's very important to emphasize that by far the most important element of entering jhana is what you're doing with all the time that you're not meditating. This is actually just as important, if not more important than the meditation methods that you're using. What are you doing with the rest of your time? So it's quite possible that you can learn a method of entering jhana, which is completely valid, completely correct. You might understand the method. You might know how to use it. But you spend the rest of your waking hours uh, listening to heavy metal music and watching violent movies and engaging in uh, gossip and chatter with your friends and you will not get anywhere close to jhana. It's just impossible. There's no hope. Uh, similarly, you might spend all your time thinking about what you plan to do with your life and where you want to go and what you want to buy and what you want to eat and what you want to do with your romantic partner. And, and then when you go to meditate, you will once again not get even remotely close to jhana. There's no chance. There actually is a chance. It's just so close to zero that it's not worth talking about. So you want to live as simple, quiet, and peaceful a life as you can. Uh, if you want to get into jhana, then your mind needs to be very peaceful and very alert all the time. So you need to be practicing mindfulness and serenity all the time. Uh, so following the eight precepts is actually a very good way of preparing your mind for jhana. Uh, so the eight precepts, uh, they include things like celibacy. Um, so uh, recognizing that romantic involvements and sexual activities are not particularly supportive of a peaceful mind. Uh, in fact, they tend to do the opposite. Uh, they're not particularly helpful if you want to uh, free your mind from sensual thoughts and sensual urges. In fact, they tend to nourish sensual thoughts and sensual urges. So celibacy is very helpful if you want to enter jhana. Um, and the practice of, uh, again, refraining from entertainment. So not watching shows, not listening to music. Uh, again, these are things which generate a lot of agitation and disturbance in the mind. Um, so when the mind is, is filled with that, that background noise and disturbance, which comes from watching a lot of uh, shows and movies and listening to a lot of music, then of course your mind is not going to stabilize enough to enter jhana. It's going to be very difficult. Um, similarly, if we're fixated on eating all the time, well, that's also not going to help us enter jhana. So in monasteries, uh, after lunch, we just stop thinking about food for the rest of the day. It's actually great. We just don't need to think about eating. It's really wonderful. Um, and also not, uh, so the uh, precept about not using luxurious bedding. Uh, so it's about not being obsessed with just lounging around in bed all day, because if you're just lounging around in bed all day, then the mind tends to become very dull and hazy. That's not, not supportive to jhana practice either. Uh, and we also want to watch out for being uh, busy um, so, uh, both in the sense of avoiding a lot of activities, 
um, and projects and engagements, but also approaching the activities and projects that we have with a mind of non-busyness. Um, there's a really lovely Zen story on this. Uh, so there's two monks uh, and one monk is, is sweeping the, the monastery grounds. And the second monk comes up to the first monk and says, you're too busy. And the monk who's sweeping replies, you should know that there is one who is not busy. The story goes on from there, but the, the rest of the story is, is irrelevant to the point I'm trying to make. Um, and of course, being a, a Zen story, there's many layers of meaning to this. But one of the simple meanings here is that even when you're engaged in activity, if your mind is still and alert, then you will not feel busy. You will not have the, the disturbance that comes from being very busy. So even when you're busy, try to not be busy. Don't be busy on the inside. Have a peaceful, still, alert mind as you're engaging in activities. Then it won't be a problem for your meditation. Similarly, try to maintain, uh, again, mindfulness all day long, uh, and especially mindfulness of your body. Uh, mindfulness of the body is, is always helpful, but it's especially helpful if your meditation practice is, in fact, mindfulness of the body uh, or mindfulness of breathing, which is a particular um, style of practicing mindfulness of the body. So all day long, be clearly aware of your body. Feel your feet as you walk. Feel your clothing on your skin. Feel the air. Uh, so everywhere you go, be clearly aware of your body. Uh, and then when you go to meditate, you'll find it much easier to enter strong samadhi. Another very important thing is avoiding arguments. Uh, so I can't even begin to list how many meditation periods I've wasted. <coughs> how many meditation periods I've wasted rehashing arguments I've had with other people. It's like, oh, oh, but then then he said, and, and then she said, and and, uh, and you can spend your whole meditation period just obsessing about, well, I should have said this, and I can't believe they said that, and uh, what an utter waste of time. So the easiest thing is just not to get involved in that kind of contentious speech in the first place, uh, and then it won't come up in your meditation. There's another lovely Zen story. Uh, so somebody went to the master and, and said, uh, how is it that you're so peaceful all the time? Uh, and the master says, well, whenever somebody disagrees with me, I just say, oh, you're right. Uh, and the student says, well, that's incredibly stupid. And the master says, oh, you're right. Apparently this story was a hit with the residents here. Um, but yeah, the, the point here is that uh, the master is practicing non-contention. Uh, because why would you want to disturb your own peace of mind just because somebody else wants to argue with you? It's just silly. Like somebody else has the plague, why would you go up and hug them? It's just silly. Now, you don't need to take on somebody else's disturbance. You can just have compassion for them and get on with your, your own peaceful life. So these are a few general words um, on the practice of jhana. Uh, so again, one thing I really want to emphasize here uh, is that jhana practice is not complicated. Uh, this is one of the, the ongoing misunderstandings about jhana practice is that uh, people try to practice jhana um, and they find it really difficult and then they think well it must be complicated um, there must be some 20-step process which I can only learn in the remote jungles of Asia if I just find the right uh, teacher who will tell me the the right elaborate method which I must do in precisely the right way uh, and it must be some deep hidden secret which is only known to the privileged few and that must be why I'm not getting jhanas, because I don't have the special, complicated, elaborate, secret method. Um, but that's actually utter nonsense. 
Uh, jhana practice is very simple. Put your mind on your meditation object and keep it there. That's it. The problem is usually everything else we're doing that's making our mind messy. The problem is not usually the meditation technique itself. Sometimes it is. Sometimes somebody is just using a really deranged meditation method. And that's why they're not getting good samadhi. And actually some meditation methods just aren't really suitable for jhana practice. Uh, for example, body scanning, completely useless if you want jhana. It's fine as an insight meditation method, but completely useless for samadhi. You will not get jhana if you're moving your mind through your body. So as long as your body and mind are still and you're practicing alertness and the five hindrances are not operating, then you will enter jhana sooner or later, possibly sooner. Um, and if it's really difficult, then the problem is probably not to do with your meditation. It's probably something to do with what you're doing with the rest of your life. Um, if you're finding jhana practice really difficult, check your precepts, check your morality, uh, check your kindness, check your generosity, uh, check your renunciation. So again, renunciation is not some frosting that monastics put in their life. Renunciation is the heart of the Buddha's teachings. And it's also the most important characteristic for samadhi practice, the most important characteristic for entering jhana. So practice renunciation in your daily life and you'll find samadhi practice gets much, much easier. So, um, I think I've said enough on the topic. So again, this is a very brief overview uh, of how to enter uh, first and second jhana. So the, the mm, earlier stages of jhana, which themselves, once again, are not, not particularly easy. Uh, so uh, again, just emphasizing jhana practice is straightforward and it's simple. But it's not easy, and the reason it's not easy is because we're so addicted to busyness and complication. So cultivate a simple mind, a still mind, and a happy mind, and samadhi will become much easier, and jhana will start to come within reach. So I think I'll, I'll end my, my talk at this point. Uh, and we still have a few minutes to take any questions. Uh, so uh, there's one question showing up. Uh, this was actually entered before the talk started. Um, so I may have already answered this, but Rick asks, what are supportive conditions for cultivating the ability to enter deeper meditation states or jhanas? What conditions impede entering deeper med meditation states? Yeah, I think I just answered that. So briefly speaking, living a busy, complicated life, uh, living a sensual life, um, living a life focused on um, engagement and activity um, and acquisition. These are all things which will, will prevent you from entering jhana. Um, whereas living a simple life of kindness and renunciation, of quiet, of mindfulness, of peacefulness, um, this will make it much, much easier. Uh, next question, Dan asks, would it be a good idea to talk to a teacher about specifics of an experience that matches specific monastics jhana description, even if years ago, or is it more an experience to let go of? I mean, it never hurts to talk to meditation teachers, uh, especially to talk to meditation teachers who uh, seem to have some knowledge and experience uh, of jhana practice. Um, it doesn't hurt to talk to them about your experience and see what they say. They might have something useful. Um, but it also doesn't hurt to just let go of the past and focus on your meditation in the moment. Um, so yeah, maybe years ago you had an experience of good samadhi. Well, the more important question is why are you not having good samadhi these days? Uh, again, is there something in your lifestyle maybe that's getting in the way? Uh, so do you need to simplify your life, practice more renunciation, 
um, commit more time to meditation practice. Mm, make your mind less messy. Uh, put less words in your mind. Uh, maybe it has. Maybe you just need to work on on simplifying and and clarifying your mind here and now. Next, uh, Jonathan says, sometimes it is easy to give up on sitting on the cushion in meditation. Uh, would you say that there are things that one can do to allow or longer sit on the cushion? Um, yeah. So. Uh, determination. Uh, it's really important to cultivate determination. One of the things that we find in a few places in the suttas, and, and actually this is something the Buddha himself said the night of his awakening, uh, is the Buddha sat down and he said, I will allow all the flesh and blood and bone, uh, all the flesh and blood to dry up and wither away till there's nothing left but skin, bones, and tendons. Uh, but I will not get up from this seat until I attain awakening. So that, that's the kind of determination you need. That determination, I will not get up from this seat until the timer goes off. Even if my body withers away to nothing, I will not get up from this seat. No matter how painful it gets, I will not get up from this seat. No matter how restless I feel, no matter how urgently I feel the need to get up, I will not. I will stay right here until the timer goes off. So that's the kind of determination you want uh, if you want to get good samadhi. Um, it's also important, as I mentioned during, uh, during both the meditation instructions and during the talk, it's very important to enjoy your meditation. Cultivate a sense of pleasure and enjoyment with your meditation. Then you'll want to stay with it. Um, if you hate meditating, then of course you're not going to want to stay with it. So love meditating. Enjoy it, find pleasure in it. Then it will be, you'll, you'll have a much easier time with it. Um, other things that help, I mean, actually just meditating a lot helps tremendously. Um, alternating between sitting meditation and walking meditation can help. Um, doing stretching um, between periods of meditation can help tremendously, um, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ultimately it comes down to determination and gradually increasing the amount of time that you sit. Um, you want to get to a point where you can sit for an hour uh, without being too bothered. And actually eventually you realize that it doesn't really matter whether it's one hour or two hours or three hours. If your determination is strong, then you can stay with it. Um, but one hour is a pretty good amount of time. You can get a lot of samadhi in one hour. Roy asks, is it necessary slash useful to learn about doing Vitaka Vichara before encountering the first jhana? Or does achieving this state trigger this spontaneously? So I'm actually going to quote, uh, well, paraphrase, paraphrase something that um, Ajahn Dick Sila Ratano said recently, recently I was uh, visiting uh, his monastery, uh, Forest Dhamma Monastery in Virginia, and I asked him about jhana practice. I always like to get different teachers' opinions on, on certain topics, and one of the topics I like to ask about is jhana. Um, I also like to ask about karma and about uh, dependent origination. These are always interesting things to hear what seniors have to say. Um, anyway, so I asked him about jhana, and, and he actually made this comment. He said, uh, a lot of people think that you need to master vitaka vichara, but they're completely wrong. What they're missing is that vitaka and vichara are obstacles. They're present in first jhana, but they're what you need to relinquish if you want to go any deeper. So he said, you should not be trying to master vitaka and vichara, you should be trying to relinquish vitaka and vichara because those are your obstacles to deep samadhi. So mental activity is necessary in the very early stages in order to begin our meditation practice. But as our samadhi deepens, we're trying to let go of all mental activity. 
because those are obstacles to samadhi. So in the very beginning, yeah, you need to, to actively point your mind towards your meditation, but then you need to work on relinquishing all thought and all mental movements because those are only getting in your way. Now, once you get started with your meditation, you want to relinquish mental activity, not build it up. Um, then Kumo says, that is very good advice on Udacha Kukucha, attention to tranquility. It is indeed there as a backdrop to all the superficial chaos in the mind. Um, yeah, I'm happy that, that you noticed this. Um, again, this is the Buddha's own instruction for how to overcome restlessness. Um, and it's remarkably powerful. So it's worth, worth experimenting with. Anita says, I have found concentrating on the chest easier than the hands. Is that okay? If it works, then it's okay. Uh, so the single greatest instruction I've ever been given for meditation practice, now this comes from my preceptor, Ajahn Pasano. Three words, do whatever works. This is the best teaching I've ever been given for meditation practice. Do whatever works. So all the instructions that you ever get from all the meditation teachers you ever learn from, all of that is just ideas, recommendations, suggestions. It's up to you to try things out and to see what works for you. And once you figure out what works, do that. And be aware that it might change over time. So the methods that worked for you last year, you might need to change it this year. The methods that worked for you yesterday, you might need to change it today. So do whatever works. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've sometimes focused on, on other parts of the body. Um, and the important thing is keeping the mind still. It's not so much where in the body you focus. The important thing is keeping the mind still and alert. Um, and as I said, enjoying, uh, enjoying the experience of the body to help you uh, move in the direction of jhana. Um, then Mike asks, uh, would you know when you're in jhana or is it something you would recollect afterwards? You will know, but because the mind is free from mental activity, you will not be thinking, I am now in jhana. In fact, if you find yourself thinking, I am now in jhana, that's a clear sign that you're not in jhana. So keep this in mind, starting from second jhana onwards, there is no mental activity happening. There's no thought happening. So that means you can't be thinking, I am in second jhana. If you think I am in second jhana, you definitely are not. It's possible in first jhana that there can be a background thought, a background thought uh, reflecting that you're in first jhana, but your knowing is the direct wordless knowing. So do you know when you're in jhana? Yes, but it's a direct wordless knowing, a nonverbal knowing. Um, just like when you're feeling pain, you don't need to tell yourself, I am feeling pain. You just know. You know directly that you're feeling pain. Nobody needs to explain it to you, and you don't need to tell yourself what's happening. You just know that it's pain. So in the same way, when you're in jhana, you just know that's what it is. Uh, you know the experience. Uh, but you're not, you're not going to be telling yourself that's what it is. Um, however, sometimes when we experience jhana, we're not actually sure, uh, um, especially the first time, um, because it's not quite what you expect. Um, one of my favorite quotes from the suttas is, um, how's it go? Yena uh, yena hi manyanti, tato tang hoti anyata. Uh, whatever they think it is, the reality is different from that. 
So in other words, whatever you think jhana is going to be like, that's not what it is. The reality is something different. So sometimes you'll have an experience and, and it could actually be a genuine experience of jhana. Uh, and then afterwards you'll be thinking back and you'll be like, whoa, what the heck was that? That meditation was not quite like any other meditation I've ever had. What was different? And it might start to dawn on you like, oh, I think that was jhana. I think I actually entered first jhana. Wow. I'm going to try to do that again and then try to do it again. And eventually you'll become quite convinced uh, that you actually do know now how to enter jhana. But yeah, it's not going to be quite what you expect it to be. Uh, whatever you think it is, that's not it. That's not it. Um, then Prisma asks, does enjoying the body count as delight and sensual pleasure? Don't worry about it. The important thing is, does it work? And the answer is, yeah, it works. Then J-O-D, I'm not sure if that's meant to be initials or Jod. J-O-D says, if you have an experience of cessation of judgment, categorization, or even time, is that a particular jhana? Um, that, so the cessation of judgment and categorization, that, can, that definitely happens by second jhana. Um, and generally speaking, you'll have something happening like that, even at first jhana. So you're no longer trying to label or judge your experience. You're just fully immersed. You're just fully immersed in this intensely enjoyable alertness and stability of mind. So yeah, you're not judging or categorizing things. Why would you? There's something far more interesting and enjoyable to do rather than playing all these little mental mind games with yourself. You can just immerse yourself in the most intense, pleasant experience imaginable. Why would you waste your time with, with all that, that meaningless mental noise, all that meaningless thinking? Um, and yeah, when you're completely engaged in the present moment, then time seems meaningless. Uh, so when you're in jhana, you're not thinking of past or future. Past and future don't, don't exist at all. Uh, there's only the present moment experience. There's nothing else going on. Let's see. Um, so then, uh, let's see. There's a couple more questions. Um, Sam says, wow, beautiful if we could really not engage in contention like the Zen story. Yeah, let's try. Let's try. It's so tempting though, when people come and challenge my ideas and my opinions, then I want to defend my opinions. So we so easily get wrapped up in our, our conceit. Uh, and when we're wrapped up in conceit, then we fall into argument. Uh, and then the mind is far from samadhi. Um, then no identity says, is metta meditation conducive to entering the first jhana? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, Bhante Ji sometimes calls metta the, the back door to jhana, uh, the shortcut to jhana. So I know I said there's no shortcuts to jhana, but actually there are a couple shortcuts to jhana. Um, one is enjoying your body, as I've been talking about. Uh, another one is practicing metta. So practice metta, and as you're practicing metta, you'll start to notice this um, powerful emotion of gentleness and benevolence. Um, and focus on that. Focus on that, that feeling of benevolence, that feeling of gentleness in the mind. Um, and focus completely on it. And the mind can enter into first jhana in that way. So you can use metta as your entry point to jhana. Yeah. Um, I don't normally practice in that way, but I know other people who, who use metta as their basis for, for uh, samadhi practice. Um, I normally use it as a uh, vaccine against aversion. 
um, because otherwise I get quite intolerable to the people who live with me. Um, but many people use metta as, a, as their basis of samadhi practice. The important thing is bringing the mind to stillness centered around the, the feeling of metta. That's the important thing. Um, then Sam says, a lay person who does not observe celibacy has to forget about practicing jhana. That's what many other teachers said too. That's not quite what I said. Uh, I did not say that it is impossible to enter jhana if you aren't celibate. I said it's much harder. There's a difference there. So it's still possible if you're not celibate. It's just much harder. It's a lot easier to enter jhana if you're celibate. So again, if you're really serious about your meditation practice, then think about practicing celibacy, even for periods of time. So practicing celibacy for a week, a month, two months, six months, a year, or longer. Uh, and see how much it improves your practice. Uh, again, there's good reasons why monks are celibate. Many, many good reasons. This is just one of them. And that's the end of the questions. And it's also after nine o'clock. So I think we'll go ahead and, and end there for the evening. Um, so uh, we can all say sadhu three times. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we'll see you next time.